we go to the contributed papers. The next paper is by Andrea De Polis. All right. So thank you very much to the organizers for including this paper in this um, conference. Um, so what I'm talking about today is the ever-changing ever challenges to price stability. This is a joint work with Leonardo Melosi from the Chicago Fed and Ivan Petrella from the University of Warwick. And given that this conference has been focusing mostly on forecasting, let me sort of put my hands in front and say that at the current stage, this paper is pretty much about uh, measurement rather than forecasting, uh, at least at the current stage. But hopefully some of the results can sort of give ideas on how to set um, sort of uh, new uh, inflation forecasting models. So I think yesterday, um, Matteo, uh, in his very um, nice introduction, mentioned that these recent shifts in the macroeconomic environment, or perhaps in inflation dynamics, have basically um, pushed central banks, the ECB and, and, the, Fed, and the Fed, to rethink uh, their um, uh, monetary policy strategy. So the idea behind this paper is really like to try and understand what are the dynamics of risk uh, to inflation that perhaps have contributed to uh, sort of to this, this thinking process. So what we start with is actually just having a look at um, inflation expectations. And this is just like to proxy for this changing environment that we, that we have in, in our mind. So here, for example, uh, you can see that here I report the um, distribution over time of survey data about inflation forecasts from professional forecasters and consumers. This is US data. And what is interesting to notice here, even though it's probably like well known by most of the audience, is that in the aftermath of the great financial crisis, like most of the uh, inflation expectation were actually coming from the tail of the overall distribution of forecasters and as well for, for consumers to some extent here. And this has remained like a, the predominant tail for the basically 10 years after, whereas now in the last two years, I mean, as we all know, we, we can see that there is this drastic change in the prevalence of like the right tail compared to the, to the left tail of the um, uh, predictive distributions. So what we were really trying to, to, to get from this picture is that even though this is only for the last 15 years or so, there seems to be like uh, sort of stark time variation in the uh, perception of the prevailing risk regimes uh, to, to inflation, both from, both from the forecasters and from consumers. However, um, surveying the literature a little bit, what, what emerges is that, um, with, with some few exceptions, most of the available models uh, to, to, to fit and forecast inflation seem to be mainly concerned about um, the long-run mean, or time varying volatility of inflation, perhaps to understand the persistence of the process. And all of this uh, basically rests on the more or less unspoken assumption of conditional Gaussianity of these models. And therefore, um, seem, from the literature, there seems to be like a little bit of a scarcity of understanding uh, about the broad risks to inflation perhaps their dynamic, and also to some extent how, it relate, how they relate to um, macroeconomic conditions or variables. So what we're really, we really after in this paper is to sort of give you an idea of what this looks like uh, over the post-war period in the US, trying to basically um, fit uh, like time varying distributions to the inflation process, and also having in mind that uh, risk does not only change for example, like at these frequencies, but can also like change over different frequencies. To make this point, let me show you here. Um, I take um, PC, core PC data for the US from the mid 60s to uh, 2020. I split the sample into recessions and expansions, which is truly like what is not a recession in my case. 
and I fit a kernel distribution to it. Nothing fancy. However, the results show like that these two sort of this different uh, phase of the business cycle behave like substantially different. In expansions, we have like a very nice distribution, which is like centered around three in this case, and it has like this very long right tail. Whereas during recession, what happens is that inflation seems to be a little bit all over the place. So what really dominates this distribution, as you can understand, is the variance. Now, of course, the first thing that should come to mind is that, wait, in this, in this, in this split, what you're putting together is actually like the high volatility, the high inflation of the 80s, and then the sort of deflationary bias period of uh, the 2000s. So here, I redo the same split, but I actually split the sample over the 2000. So I want to understand what changes, for example, what, what are, how, how this distribution look like, like during the high volatility period and in the recent times. And you see that the, the, this distribution now they look like quite different. So the blue one, which is the early part of the sample, 65 to 2000, has like a very high mean, consistent with the fact that, volatility, that inflation was very high, and it has some positive skewness, so like longer right tail compared to the left one. However, what is very interesting, what I believe is very interesting, is that if we then focus on the second part of the sample, most of these moments seem to have like changed dramatically. The mean is well below the 2% target that uh, we, we, we like, at which we would like to have inflation. And this is consistent with the idea that I mentioned before, like uh, the strategy review was mainly spurred by, partly spurred by this, this data here. Standard deviation is low, but especially skewness as flip sign. So the distribution, the sort of unconditional distribution of this data actually now seems to have like negative skewness rather than positive skewness. So if we take these two pictures like together, what I want you basically uh, to take away from this is that inflation risk seem to vary not only like at higher frequencies of business cycle frequencies, but seems to like vary also slowly over longer periods of time. And this is something that we will try to tackle into our estimation strategy. So let me right, get into what we do and some preview of the results. So as I said, we are trying to measure the evolution over time of inflation, especially of inflation risk. And we do that by employing a flexible time varying parameter model. This is something I developed uh, in a, an earlier paper with Ivan and David who's here in the audience. And the first key result that we find is that inflation asymmetry varies substantially over time. Or if you prefer, the inflation process seems to feature time varying skewness. We also try to understand what drives these this processes, especially the risk process, so the, the skewness process. And so we try to add some uh, exogenous predictors to the law of motion. I will show you in detail how we set everything up. And what comes out is that risk that we uh, think of as like the combination of variance and, and skewness seem to be mainly related to policy regimes to changes in, poli in policy regimes. And then lastly, through the lenses of our model, we basically can sort of understand how some of these predictors that we use sort of feed into the forecasting process of expected inflation. And this is really a byproduct of our modeling strategies. And especially we will show you something, I will show you something about the Phillips curve. And what we find is that um, these relations seem not to be stable over time. And really, again, seems to be related to like the level of risk of the perceived risk in the inflation outlook. So before I move on, so I just want to give three main takeaways that we were really thinking uh, hard with uh, Leonardo in terms of like how to frame all of this to be relevant for policy. First one is that we find that monetary and fiscal regimes are what really matters to understand the long run dynamic of inflation risk. And I will show you later that this, 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 this picture shows up quite nicely in one of the decomposition that I, will, that I will have. So because there is this dependence on the prevailing um, policy regime, what we argue is that there is no one-size-fits-all fit, one policy framework to stabilize inflation. 
And why is that? Well, this is because, as I will hopefully get to show you in a very simple example, um, higher order moments in the inflation distribution should actually be taken into account when thinking about makeup strategies based, for example, on average, the average inflation targeting. So these are the three sort of takeaway that we want to highlight in terms of how do we relate our findings to like the policy process. Let me now uh, dive into the model specification. So the model in its, uh, um, in its first part is like quite simple, is we have like a measurement equation for inflation where uh, mu t is a time varying location. So you can think of this as the central tendency of uh, a distribution. And then epsilon t is an innovation which is distributed according to a skew t distribution. And then we have sigma t and rho t, and these are like a time varying scale and a time varying shape parameter. So the shape parameter really sort of captures the asymmetry of the distribution. And so you can think of these three parameters to map like more or less linearly into the mean variance, mean standard deviation actually, and skewness of the distribution. A nice feature of this distribution that we use is that we have a very actually well-behaved and nice likelihood function from which I just want to highlight that um, as basically almost all the skew t that we are now used to since the last few years, it encompasses uh, like symmetric distribution like the T, but especially the Gaussian. And so this is to say that even if we will have time varying parameter, the model is free to actually reject completely the presence of time variation in any of the moments, especially in skewness, if that's what you might be worried about, and just collapse to like a conditional, a conditionally Gaussian uh, uh, model. How do we uh, allow for time variation in the parameter? Well, we place ourselves basically within the score-driven setting. We have Simeon here, which is one of the main, uh, the first author that proposed this framework. And the idea is that we have these three parameters. Actually, we are gonna, for, for, for like easiness of the estimation, we're gonna model like the log scale and a, and, a, and a transformation of the asymmetry parameter. And we're gonna allow this score-driven law of motion, which is really like uh, uh, f like a, ran a random walk law of motion for the parameter, plus some additional predictors, and I will talk about this in a second, from which you can see I split between like this X bar and X tilde, and this is because we will have some predictors for the long run process, and some predictors which seem to be more related to like shortly fluctuation in the inflation process. And then this ST, which is what is generally called the scale score, to give you an idea, sort of captures the unexplained time variation in this process. And this is nothing more than a rescaled version of the first derivative of the log likelihood function with respect to the parameter of interest. I mean, this might be like not uh, intuitive at first, but I mean, these models like seem to work like very nicely. There are very nice applications that are using this model. And this is the way I always rationalize the role of the score to give a, a sort of an easy interpretation. That is the scale score simply maps the prediction error into like an appropriate update for the parameter of interest. Why do we believe that this framework is actually like uh, a good one within our, our framework? This is because our update mainly has like two interesting features. The first one is the outlier discounting mechanism. This really comes from the T distribution. And the idea is that our model, sort of whenever it faces an outlier, decides how much it wants to learn from it. So if something, if, if an observation is quite unusual, the model is able to downplay it. And so like, it's not gonna incorporate a lot of noise, but whenever the model understands that there is perhaps like a change in the level of the parameter, actually the model is gonna, it's gonna go in that direction. It's not gonna treat it anymore as an outlier. So this seems to be like a first nice um, feature. The second one concerns mainly the updating of the asymmetry parameter. And the updating of the asymmetry parameter means that here we have on the x-axis like the um, standardized prediction error, so zero one variable. Here we have this, this core variable and what you see is that in, a, in the case in which we have positive skewness, that is this green light, so rho is positive, we are mainly expecting positive 
uh, observations. However, if the model then sees something that is like negative or even deeply negative, the model will want to update the asymmetry like quite strongly. The data is telling you that there is evidence perhaps for a change in the sign of skewness, so the model wants to pick this up, incorporate it into the parameter dynamic, and then move on. So the, the idea that what, what I want to highlight from this part is that the model is really able to capture turning points in the underlying series like quite quickly. And this, I believe, is a strong feature of, of our model. We have a very nice closed form um, expression for the um, expectation of this distribution, so for expected inflation. And this is basically like um, a linear combination of the location, so like again the central tendency of the distribution, and then this nonlinear function of the scale and shape. So in this, in this term, basically, you will have volatility and skewness, so to speak, interact in a nonlinear way. And so what, what, what we are doing in reality is that the model starts from a linear dependence between predictors and parameters and transforms it into nonlinear relation between predictors and the moments of the predictive distribution, which is what we are really after here. And this is going to come at end later when I will show you something about the Phillips curve. OK, let me talk about predictors very briefly. Uh, Nine minutes, okay. <laughs> Predictors very briefly. So we want to investigate these nonlinear relations between like um, um, inflation moments and, and some, some like well-known predictors of inflation. We consider some short-term parameters like monetary policy stance, the unemployment gap, measures of uh, the, um, a cyclical measure of unit labor cost. And then we have commodity price, which includes oil. So we put all together. And the real exchange rate. And then we consider some variable for the long run. And these variables are like money growth, the measure of the fiscal stance, the trend of unit labor cost, and the long run real rate. And I will show you in a second what we apply a filter to actually do, to, do the road, to, the road, to this raw data to try and extract like smooth trends to relate to the dynamic of inflation in our model. And we use like the Mueller and Watson filter, which basically what it does, it decomposes like the long run dynamic, uh, in our case at frequencies like of longer than 10 years, uh, by basically creating a linear combination of sine and cosine functions. So we will have something very smooth. Let me show you what I mean when I, when I talk about this decomposition. So here I give you an example. This is just one of the variables that we use, is the long run real rate, which we find like quite interesting. This is the long run real rate is the black line in this picture. And then I take, for example, like a model free measure of skewness, of time varying skewness from the data. In this case, I use like a five year rolling window uh, quantile skewness. You can, we reproduce this for like with sample skewness. You can use different rolling windows. You can use like different quantiles in the skewness. You will still get like to a very, a pretty much the same picture. And what you can see here is that at the beginning of the sample, there seemed not to be like much of a correlation between the two variables, but things seem to like move together like much more in the second part of the sample. So because we believe that the long run real rate is like sort of can create like some long run, um, some long can, can actually give some information about inflation risk over the long run, we want to understand what is this trend. This is what we do. We fit like a series of sine and cosine function to this series. We do the same for the red line. And again, we find that here, the dynamic does not seem to match very well. But here, there seem to be like some sort of predictive sort of relation between the black line and the red line. And what we are trying to do next is basically to exploit this evidence in, in our model. If you're Curious about the other variables. I mean, we also plot like an in-sample long run covariability, as the authors call it. And we see that basically among the four variables that are left significant in our panel, uh, actually like three of them seem to be like strongly correlated with the skewness, which is really what we're after. I will actually skip this in the interest of time. Results. So I'll skip this. Anyway, we go Bayesian so that uh, we fit with most of the of the papers so far. 
Here, I think a, a first model check that we always need to have a look at is do our first and second moment that we all know make sense? And I think it pretty much, they, they, they all look like nice. So the mean, seem, the mean process seems to be like very in line with what you will get with a um, standard stock and Watson model, where you see that basically most of the time variation is picked up by this red line, which in our case is what we call like the trend. That is basically the um, time varying mean if we exclude all the uh, short term predictors. And we see that basically there are meaningful deviations only here in the, in the 70s and 80s, and perhaps something here just below before the 2000. Inflation also seems to uh, behave like as expected. We have like strong peaks in the 70s and 80s, but then we capture this dynamic consistent with the great moderation where like basically in the mid 80s, inflation starts to go like down and remains like quite slow until basically at least the great financial crisis. I think this is the most interesting uh, plot that I would like to discuss. And this is a measure of time varying skewness of the US core PC from the 60s. I mentioned before in the introduction that we, thought of, I, I use the word regimes a lot. And this is because what we find is that skewness seem to move in sort of regimes or a regime-like uh, pattern where basically we have like high skewness as one would expect in the 70s and 80s. This starts to go down uh, like from the mid 80s to and, and basically and turns negative here at the, uh, in the early 90s and stays negative ever since until the last period. The last period here, we see that there is this uptick of this long run skewness, even though total skewness seems to be negative. This perhaps is going to be puzzling. Uh, how can we estimate like negative skewness in this in these last uh, like two years? Well, this is because you should think of skewness about the mean. Our mean is already very high, and so the model is telling us there is not much historical sort of evidence for uh, inflation to go even higher, but perhaps it's more plausible that it's gonna come down at a certain point. I'm gonna also show you why we think that that is the case. So here. I decompose the time variation of the asymmetry parameter. So this is not the skewness, but it pretty much relates to that, into the contribution of the long run parameters, of the long run predictors. And for example, here you can see that there is a prevalence of unit labor cost pushing inflation up during the 70s and 80s. This is pretty much consistent with, with actually like historical observations. And then we see that most of the reason why in skewness is coming down is because of like, uh, reducing uh, nomin uh, re long run real rate and like negative fiscal surpluses in the in this in this period of time, and in recent time we see that con and I will be more specific about this later. We see that there is like a negative drag coming from, for example, the long run real rate that, if you will, is a proxy for the zero lower bound. So what explains cyclical uh, skewness to be like negative in this time? especially in the very last part of the sample. This is pretty much like the zoom in that you saw before. You see that monetary policy in our, uh, in our, in our setup, which is this uh, purple, uh, which is like in purple, seem to be actually exerting some negative drag to skewness. So like to some extent, what we see from the data is that monetary policy seems to actually go in the right direction of trying to reduce the upside risk to inflation. All right, so I have a minute, so I want to show you this. So in line also with some of the results that we saw before about the Phillips curve, we cannot really devise a, a full-blown Phillips curve as uh, we've seen before, but we can understand the elasticity of the expected inflation to some of the predictors that we include. And this is easy because as I show you, like the, the equation for the expectation is like quite, quite simple. We simply differentiate it with respect to XT. XT in our case is gonna be the unemployment gap. And here, we basically estimate a sort of measure of time barring Philip curve. And what we see is that this relation seems to be like strongly negative in the 80s and 90s, and it sort of flattens uh, like, uh, like right after during the, the sort of early 90s and, and all around the 2000. And there seems to be like some evidence of the Philip curve resurrecting in this in this last time 
well, why this happens in our model? Well, let me try to explain this as fast as I can. In here, we have, we have like the Phillips curve coefficients that are like highlighted in these colored sort of scatters. The, the magnitudes are this, these iso ones. And here you have like the asymmetry coefficient and the variance, the, the volatility. And basically what comes up is that the Philip curve relation seems to be relevant only when risk is very high. Whenever there is not much risk about inflation, the Philip curve relation seems to be like much more muted. And this is something that we find interesting and we believe that can be informative about how policymakers think about the Philip curve. We can also deal about the balance of risk. I'm gonna skip that, it's in the paper. And so I will skip also <laughs> this. And we basically model time variation in skewness. We find that it relates to many um, historical facts about US inflation. And I look forward to the discussion from Julia. Thank you very much. Okay. The discussion is uh, Julia Schaumburg from Birgit University. Brian. Brian. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, thank you very much to the organizers um, for uh, inviting me to discuss this very interesting paper today. Um, and thank you, uh, Andrea, for this, uh, for this nice presentation. Um, so uh, this is a cool paper. I'm going to start by giving an overview. Um, so, so broadly, the topic and the goal uh, of the paper is to, um, to model and analyze the dynamics and also the drivers of um, uh, U.S., uh, inflation across, um, yeah, since um, since the World War II, so basically across a long time period um, with many shifts in um, in market conditions, but also shifts in, in monetary and fiscal policy policy regi regimes. The um, the methodology is uh, could be um, described as a score driven nonlinear trend cycle model for three of the parameters of the conditional distribution, right? So, so, the, so, so the idea is to, to, to take uh, the location, the scale, and the asymmetry parameters of the conditional distribution uh, and have them, and, 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 um, yeah, and give them uh, a, a trend cycle specification. Um, and, uh, and this is also uh, then uh, enri enriched by um, observed regressors that then um, help to predict Long run and, and to disentangle uh, long run and short run dynamics of these uh, of the inflation uh, the conditional inflation moments. This um, a model can be used to um, yeah for, for for policy. So I think this is, is actually really relevant um, for for monetary policy um, because the findings can also be um, interpreted in in a, in, a, in a quite rich way. So um, so one of the findings um, that. Uh, Andrea didn't um, have time to present was uh, was these uh, shifts in the balance of risks, what what they call balance of risks over time, implying that uh, there is not one particular monetary policy or also um, yeah uh, that exists for for all the different regimes as you called it uh, in this in the sample. Also, they find that uh, fiscal policy, the fiscal policy stance, plays an important role, for, especially for the long run dynamics. Um, and and um, yeah, the um, example of the time varying slope of the Phillips curve, which is also in line with what Simian um, presented earlier today, uh, is also is also one of the features of the model that um, yeah that uh, makes a lot of sense and can be interpreted um, and and used. Okay, so um, the the model has been presented. Of course, um, I just it just always helps me to to look at the equations to to really understand what's going on. And I have to say, I had to go to the to the earlier paper, um, the methodology one, uh, the one with uh, Davide. And um, so uh, so we have the the observation equation here, um, in a, um, where uh, yeah we then have these uh, three time varying uh, parameters mu, um, sigma, and rho. And uh, and they are again decomposed into a long term and a short term uh, component, each uh, that are then driven, uh, yeah, that, that have a score driven uh, specification dynamics, uh, and these uh, matrices A, B, and C here uh, are restricted coefficients that allow to identify this decomposition into long and short um, short run dynamics. And uh, yeah, and S is uh, again is a scale score that serves as a, the uh, innovation to to those time varying parameters here. 
Um, so so uh, here, this, what, what is really um, uh, intuitive and interesting, I think, about this uh, approach is that we can, that you can basically um, obtain conditional expectations um, for, um, for inflation that incorporate the other features of the distribution apart from the location parameter as well. Yeah? And so, so, so time varying um, uh, scale and time varying uh, shape parameter enter the conditional distribution. Uh, and this also then gives rise to these time varying elasticity. So, so, uh, so the impacts of, uh, of changes in the regressors will then also um, potentially um, uh, depend on, on time varying skewness time varying asymmetry and and time varying scale and this also just 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 comes out of the model specification so that's why i think it's, it's really nice and and um uh, and, and and gives gives rise to these to this uh, to these rich uh, uh it has a has a potential to to give rise to very rich uh, interpretations so um uh, my my first set of comments is about the model specification so um it's just striking and i suppose I uh, suppose this is not unexpected that I would, uh, would bring this up, right? So uh, you have four um, parameters uh, in your skewed T distribution, and three of them have dynamics. Um, but the, uh, the degrees of freedom parameter that one would maybe um, associate with the kurtosis of the distribution is, is kept constant. And I was, so this is not uh, discussed in the paper. I was just wondering if this is something um, that is not su just not supported by the data. Maybe time varying asymmetry is enough. Uh, but it would be definitely um, interesting to to learn um, what yeah what was the motivation to to keep the degrees of freedom constant. Um, so uh, yeah, so so as I so what I uh, what I presented earlier was this, this um, uh, these uh, conditional the conditional uh, expectation also under other conditional moments. Um, they uh, they are well features of the model of the um, of this model that is fully parametric, um, but there are also some choices. So it, it, it seems very flexible, but there are also some choices, not only um, leaving uh, the degrees of freedom constant, but also, for example, uh, leaving uh, beta constant, which is, the, um, uh, the, uh, which is the, the vector of coefficients related to the regressors, right? And, and especially since you were talking a lot of about shifts in regimes, one could also, one just, I, I just wondered what happens if you would uh, merely split the sample, for example, um, uh, and, and whether uh, the time variation, this massive time variation that you pick up in the moments is maybe also related to um, yeah, uh, time varying impacts of these, of these different uh, groups of regressors. And also, again, a somewhat related comment. Um, so as I'm not entirely sure um, uh, in how what the relationship between the model uh, in this paper is and and the uh, the model in the in the earlier paper, um, but but uh, in your equation here you basically so in equation seven of the paper and I think you, you presented another version of this earlier as well. Um, so there there is basically um, uh, the, the the short run dynamics or the the short run fluctuations are only driven by those uh, short run uh, regressors. So the xt xt tildes, as you called them. Um, so that means that if if there are some uh, xts that you're maybe missing in the model, they all go into the long term component. So so I think in the in the other uh, version of the model there was a score in the short term dynamics as well, and I was just wondering where what what happened to that. Um, uh, yeah, um, and and maybe also uh, related to to the uh, to the earlier uh, presentation, maybe maybe there are some short term uh, dynamics or some short term regressors that uh, that that especially in in this recent period, yeah, uh, have become more more um, more relevant, like such as supply supply side shocks in particular that are not. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't. I mean, you have the commodity prices, but but maybe there is also some more maybe from that that could be included. Uh, yeah, all in all, um, I would like to see some diagnostics. So, so I mean, this is a re really nice model, um, and and it has great a great interpretation if it's the right model. So, so if we if we look at the time variation, if we look at those dynamics, and yeah, do we do we want to believe? That? So, whether we want to believe them or not, I think depends on um, what model diagnostics would look like, especially. So, for example, we could look at the scores, right? So, look for um, if, if there's something um, 
some patterns uh, in the scores, right? Under correct specification, we would have martingale differences for the, for the, for the scores of the model. Um, another way would, would be to do an out-of-sample forecasting exercise. Um, so some uh, more minor comments. Um, so so f ab about the terminology, um, so I was a bit confused at times um, what exactly is the difference between inflation risk versus um, volatility, skewness, shape, asymmetry, skew things like that. So, so it would be nice to kind of fix the terminology um, clearly at the from the start. Um, I was also, yeah, so this is also a notational thing, and I'm out of time. Uh, you condition on the past of, of inflation here in your conditional expectations, and I was just wondering, so you, you should condition on the regressors as well, I think, right? So so that, that um, yeah. Um, and then um, you, you provide the, the analytic uh, closed form uh, expressions for conditional mean and variance, but not the skewness. And I was also wondering if that, why, why that is, um, if there is there's... Because that would be especially interesting since we're all looking at the, we're looking at the plot. Um, yeah, and then all, all in all also clarify the, the relationship to the earlier model. And that's, uh, that those were my comments. So uh, super interesting, very useful, and um, some model diagnostics would be interesting to see. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Questions from the floor? Thank you. Uh, it's again Blaze Mazur from National Bank of Poland. I congratulate you on the excellent paper you and co-authors. I like it very much. Uh, however, I would like to ask a couple of questions. Uh, well, first, uh, it seemed to me I was I am not sure, but that you missed that autoregressive part in this score updating. Uh, so I would like to ask, uh, what if you include this autoregressive part and why you prefer not to have it, right? And uh, second, what if you, instead of core, if you look at total inflation, uh, because I, I, could you also specify what kind of, what, what, is, it, is it just quarter on quarter blown up to, to, to annual, or is it uh, year on year inflation, right? Uh, and uh, and uh, the, the last one is, uh, uh, is the answer to the question about degrees of freedom. I mean, degrees of freedom reflect rare events. And it's extremely difficult to figure out short-run dynamics for something that rules uh, rare events, because uh, then if you have if you have a calm period, they will mean revert, and then you 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 see some rare event that kicks in, right? So I I totally agree with with keeping constant uh, degrees of freedom in this distribution. Thank you. More questions? Hi, uh, this is Davide. Um, and there are just a few questions about the specification. Mm, I'd like to see what the contribution of the X variable on driving uh, short run and long run, which is a sort of like uh, pre-filtered data. So I think a sort of robustness analysis could be that you first fit the model, like our original paper, without putting the X variables. And so sort of like completely data driven and then check if there is somehow uh, a square with your uh, predictors. You know. Otherwise, it seems that it's too much driven by your uh, pre-filtering uh, uh, operation. And then uh, um, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's also to show to show how uh, the, the 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 various driver that you you put in your uh, model specification are contributing to to drive the asymmetry versus the uh, the volatility right so uh, then final question is more applied since probably you use U, uh, us data with leonardo it seems that there is much role for energy prices why for us it's much more important so this Thank you, Andrea, for the very nice presentation. I guess I have a couple of questions. One, I guess, is related to what David and, and, and the other question you received. So if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you have a random walk plus something else, and then there is the score. And then you try to separate long and, and short run effect. But in principle, if you have, you know, very out, outlier, you update the parameter, it's a random walk, so it's already a super persistent shock. 
So I was wondering, you know, can you, can you, can you, do you, can you really avoid the uh, autoregressive part if you want to separate long and short run effects? That's that's the first question. The second one, um, the the uh, the second one is about if you use different measures of inflation. I guess it would be interesting, for instance, if you exclude co uh, like uh, you look at the core CPI, you exclude food and energy. Does the skewness really matter that much, or is mostly volatility? Um, if you can elaborate on that, thanks. That's it. All right. So thank you very much for the nice question. Thank you, Julia, for the nice discussion. So I'll try to address all all the points. So time varying degrees of freedom. Uh, I think we already had like a sort of good answer. I mean, we did try to feed it. We did try also before in the other paper. It's not always nice what comes out. It doesn't really help like for the distribution, like the other moment does not change as much, but it makes the estimation like quite much more difficult. So we did not really see like much scope for that, but that is clearly like uh, a sensible point to, to, to address yeah, in, in the paper. Uh, and then like time varying uh, betas or like the sorts of the static parameters of the model, especially the betas, uh, that makes absolute sense. Uh, we, we were actually thinking in that direction already. Uh, to understand like breaks, for example, also in this Philip curve relation, not only due to the parameters of the model. Um, we were like reluctant at first because we would like add an extra layer of sort of complexity to the model that is already like not very straightforward. Uh, but this is absolutely like a well taken point. We were, we were thinking about this. And the same goes for like forecasting. We are, we are working on that. We have an issue that has been like sort of flagged by David as well with this pre-filtering variable because we want to sort of try to still say something about like long run predictors, long run predictions, trying to use like long run predictors and that creates like a little bit of an issue. So this is also something that we are working on. And same with the with the analytics. I mean we this we, we we are putting things together like pretty much as we did in the other paper. So like absolutely like you you made like some very good points about sort of robustifying the methodological contribution sort of part of this paper. And last thing, like why we did not show like uh, an analytical formula for skewness, uh, we have it. It's just that we were in, in the paper we are interested in understanding like the interplay between like the symmetry parameter, so skewness in a sense, and the moments that we are most mainly used to think about, so mean and variance. Skewness would only depend on the degrees of freedom and the symmetry parameters, so you would like lose all the sort of location and scale effect. And so it seems for now that it's like less less relevant, but you're right, like the skewness that I presented is just like fitting the time the time varying grow and, and, and degrees of freedom into the skewness equation that I have. Um, so the other question is why not what the autoregressive law of motion? Um, so there are two main reasons that we found uh, like while we were experimenting. First one is that if we add like an autoregressive law of motion, even if we try to shrink it to like, like no sort of persistence, so to speak, the parameter would like basically always go to the 9999 or whatever is the upward bound that, that you would put. So we were just like sort of easing a little bit the estimation because we have a lot of betas and we were just like putting it to one. Second, because we have the split between like short and long, the uh, short run parameters actually like they already embed a lot of persistence. So in that case, we would like sort of build up like much more persistent that we would like. Uh, but yeah, this is something that we've tried. I mean, we could also like revert to the to the autoregressive law of motion. I know that there is this issue with like sort of the filter, like the random wall filter, but it doesn't seem to be an issue per se. Um, and we did try. Uh, we we did try. We we don't have it in the paper because like this paper originally was motivated by a policy sort of question that we had with Leonardo. So core PCE is the relevant inflation measure in the US. Uh, we have estimates are reported in the current version for um, PC headline and CPI core and headline. The image, is, the, the picture that you will get is pretty much the same. 
actually for CPI, you would get even like nicer sort of skewness dynamics. So I've always been a fan to use CPI, but uh, there is an interest for, for PC. Um, and um, then, I mean, we also had, we also, uh, I, I also experimented with Euro area data, and then of course the set of predictor must change. Uh, I mean, I did not really play a lot with energy data yet. This is again in the pipeline. I mean, the original paper actually was, was a comparison between uh, Euro area, US and Japan. Now we move to the US for these policy reasons, but we are actually planning to go back to that. So hopefully we will have a, uh, an answer for that. Um, and um, I don't know if I missed anything. Otherwise, thank you, thank you very much.